drink in the chapel. Is it first possible? Is It's a great congregation. Uh, so what about to go into it? You, know, you think the Northeast is a desert theologically. But there are some really good other hosts out there. Is there any Catholic there in Austin? Or yeah. It used to be with the Irish. There? Right. It used to be is a good way to put it. All right, so today we're going to start sacraments, and we're going to begin, of course, with baptism. Um, so I have time, and since I'm conducting the service, I've got to get out of here on time, so I better start on time. Uh, let's, uh, let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, how gracious you are to us that you sent John the baptizer as your forerunner that he might proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins, and that baptism was administered, uh, that your people would be comforted by your divine mercy. Be with us in our day as we receive baptism in great joy and confidence. Allow us to um, depend on it unto our salvation, and make sure that we understand it to be full of your blessings. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Okay. So, sacraments. Um, this word means a sacred act that's instituted by God. This is purely by definition, right? So, I'll tell you what I mean by that in a second. Um, it gives forgiveness of sins and uses a visible means or tangible means. Like tangible by touchable, yeah. Um, and what I mean by by definition, how do you put this right? Um, so literally, the Lutheran Church does not have a doctrine of sacraments. I know that sounds weird and you want to kill me for saying it. I, I understand. But what I mean by that is the Lutheran Church has the doctrine that there are specific sacred acts instituted by God baptism, Lord's Supper, holy absolution. And what we do is we look at them separately and say, ooh, they seem to have some similarities. Notice I say similarities, not, they're not identical. Therefore, what is, <clears throat> excuse me, therefore what about them is similar? And we start to categorize and group them together and, and that grouping is called sacraments. Okay, let me just pause there. Do you have questions about that matter of definition? Kevin, we're going to move this podium. No, 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 not at all. Just stay put. Yeah. Well, you're getting ahead of me. We'll 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 get there. Let me talk about that. Yeah. Now, the other part to this is that the Bible actually does talk about what, uh, what gets translated in English as the mysteries. So, uh, St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 4, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. What's a steward do? Yep, takes, it manages for the master, right? So these are the master's gifts. The pastors are the people who are to steward the master's gifts for the benefit of the master's people, right? Okay. Um, so you do have this word. And what's interesting, of course, is in your Latin translation, the word mysteria, mysteries, is translated sacramenta, sacraments, sacred act. Um, so you can see why there's an early identification with these things as sacraments, all right? Um, what I just do here quickly is give you a matrix and run through uh, the various um, 
sacred acts that were defined by the Fifth Lateran Council, which that's Roman Catholic, as sacraments. So before the Fifth Lateran Council, there were 12 sacraments, and the Pope decided to change the number and went to seven. And so we'll just run through these so that it's clear. So it's helpful to see from our perspective what things fit. This is like Sesame Street, right? What things belong, what things don't, right? You're a young father, you recognize this. All right. So is baptism instituted by God? Certainly. Uh, you can look a number of places, but Matthew 28, 19, go baptize. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, does baptism give forgiveness of sins? Yes. The Bible specifically attributes forgiveness of sins to baptism. Not just in one place, but at least in Acts 2.38 for sure. Uh, is there a visible means in baptism? Yeah, water. Holy absolution. Is it instituted by God? Yes. Right? He says to his disciples, um, when he breathes on them, go forgive sins. Whatever sins you're forgiven are forgiven unto them. Whatever sins you withhold, they are withheld unto them. And that's in John 20. That's the post-resurrection appearance of Jesus on the night of his resurrection to his disciples in John. Does it give forgiveness? Well, forgiveness gives forgiveness, I would say. So that's kind of an oxymoron. And then finally, what's the visible means? That's David's problem. Um, okay, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, the mouth that delivers, let's say that. The mouth that roars. Um, in other words, the confessor. And the, the confessor, of course, is the person who hears the confession and delivers the absolution. Okay. Now, you know, we'll get there probably after Christmas because I want to get to the Lord's Supper next week. But, but we'll talk about that in some detail when we get there. Oops, sorry, I gave it away. Is the Lord's Supper instituted by God? Yeah, Christ says, keep on doing this in remembrance of me. All right. uh, does it give forgiveness? Yes, there's a specific promise of forgiveness attached to it. Whoever drinks of this cup, whoops. I love technology. There we go. Is it back? Yeah, all right. Um, receive forgiveness of sins. Um, is there a visible means? Or are there visible means to make it clearer? Yes. You have bread and wine. Um, is marriage instituted by God? Absolutely. It is the first sacred act instituted by God. It was given in the garden before the fall. Does it give forgiveness of sins? No, it necessitates more forgiveness of sins. <laughs> as any of you who are married well know. Um, are there visible means? Such as? Uh, that's interesting. I, I mean, some people argue that the visible means is the ring, but you can get married without a ring, so that's not, and the Bible never mentions rings or exchange of rings, right? Um, in the, oh, probably right up into what we would call the modern era, say about the mid-17th century, proof of consummation was considered to be the visible means. Yeah, you, yeah, um, yeah. I mean that. Yeah, that's one of the points. It is civil, um, but I mean we don't require proof of consummation any longer. So, I mean basically because it doesn't give forgiveness, and the visible means can't be. You can't find a passage in the Bible that says thou shalt. Yeah, exactly. So we would just say there's no visible means. Now, don't misunderstand. I'm not then saying Mary Jane important. <laughs> I just wouldn't categorize it with the things that give forgiveness. OK? 
Okay. Purely a question of categorization. Um, extreme unction or last rites or um, the anointment with oil is now what they call it. Uh, is it instituted by God? So you only have a mention of anointment in James 5. But it doesn't say you should do it or that it needs to continue to be done. It simply describes it as a practice that was done in the first century. Um, does it give forgiveness of sins? Of course not. There's no mention. Are visible means used? Well, yes. Oil, right? But again, you wouldn't categorize it with sacraments because it doesn't give forgiveness of sins. Um, churches in the Missouri Synod actually have gotten all their knickers in a knot about anointment with oil. And some have, I would just say that. And in my opinion, it's, uh, it, I mean, it's chasing after the ephemeral uh, to the detriment of the substantial. You know, the sacraments get sort of shoved into the background if you get all excited about the anointment of oil. So, I don't know. I think it's a bit strange, personally. Um, is the ministry instituted by God? Absolutely. He who hears you, hears me. That's what Jesus says. Um, does being a pastor make you more forgiven? No, it makes you need forgiveness more. There's no doubt about that, but you're not more forgiven. Um, the one thing I would just say, again, God has commanded uh, those to whom he's given the Holy Spirit to give absolution. Well, that includes me, and it certainly includes you, too, by the way, right? But, but I certainly have the Spirit, ergo I should be giving absolution. But that's not the same as receiving forgiveness of sins, and that's what is definitive about a sacramental act. It actually gives forgiveness of sins. Um, what would the visible means be in the holy ministry? That's a tough one. It's almost like not visible, but auditory of hearing the word or speaking. Well, yeah, you're on the right track, I would say, in a way, but that's not where I'm going, sorry. <laughs> I became a pastor by the laying on of hands, right? Now, the problem with that as a visible means is the Bible only gives you examples of the laying on of hands. It never commands that the laying on of hands be done. So, um, some Lutherans believe um, ministry is a sacrament. Some Lutherans do not. So, well, let me just finish. Is confirmation instituted by God? Any 12-year-old will tell you it's instituted by the devil. <laughs> uh, no, it's not in the Bible. Does it give forgiveness? No, it necessitates more, both on the part of the teacher and the student. And finally, are there visible means? Well, of course not. So... Um, Sure, but that really applies to everybody. And it's always that way in connection with baptism, right? We, we're always teaching everything Christ has commanded, right? Um, but it's not a separate rite with visible means and so on, right? Now, the point here is that the definition ends up with some squishiness. And I'm just making the point that Lutherans don't get all in a knot about defining things uh, and battening down all the hatches with really big screws so that nothing comes loose. The Bible's not susceptible to that. So it's not wrong for me to say there are actually four sacraments because the Lutheran confessions will give me support for that. It's not wrong for me to say there are three sacraments. It's not wrong for me to say there are two sacraments. I would never say there's only one. It just depends how you define things. And again, the definition comes from here. It doesn't come from the Bible. All right? Now, 
Again, you're perfectly welcome to say, well, I don't think holy ministry is a sacrament. Okay. But then you don't turn around and say, and we should get rid of pastors. Right? That is sometimes the conclusion people make. And I'm here to say I'm not in support of that idea. <laughs> right? Um, so, so again, uh, we're, we're not, we don't want to be doctrinaire about stuff the Bible's not doctrinaire about. If the Bible's doctrinaire, well, we're just going to stand on that. But where it's not there, you don't have any right to say, thus saith the Lord. Okay? Questions? Oh, I have no idea. I mean, I might have known at one time, but I have no idea now. Your homework for this week is to go look it up. <laughs> Luther has a wonderful thing uh, early in, in his career where he talks about the marks of the church. And we think of the marks of the church as preaching and sacraments. But if you look at Luther's list, it's preaching, sacraments, acts of mercy, you know, it's like six different things for Luther. And the Holy Cross is the last one, suffering, one of the marks of the church. So, you know, again, we have these theological categories that are helpful for understanding, memory, instruction, all those things. But you have to be very careful that you haven't, like, acted like they dropped down from heaven on golden plates. The Bible is the standard. What's not in the Bible, you're hard-pressed to make anything a standard, except in a purely human way, right? We're going to agree always to do this this way. That's fine, whatever. Um, but you're not going to say by having those definitions, everyone's going to heaven that agrees with the definitions. That's not, that's not Christian faith, right? So you have to keep that all kind of straight. Deidre. Right. But, and I did look it up and it was helpful to me, uh, means an action or system by which a result is brought. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this, I'm just trying to think. Oh, let me just go on from here because it t attaches to your, to your point. Let, just hang with me. Let's move on to the next point. So, the issue is sacraments and the incarnation. So I've got this lovely little quote from Luther from our large catechism where he says this, The sacraments and all the external things ordained and instituted by God should not be regarded according to the gross external mask as we see in the shell of a nut. This, of course, is the chestnut, uh, which as children we fought over, um, but as that in which God's word is enclosed. So we're susceptible to the visible, the physical, the earthly, and so on. Because that's what we are. God created us that way. And what he does is he employs those earthly, visible, physical, tangible means to deliver that which is spiritual to us. And so to find him, we have to find the signs that he himself has instituted to bear himself and his gifts to his people. Right? And of course, people object to this. You know, how is it that bread can be the body of Christ, using the sacrament as the example? And finally, you just have to say, all of Christianity is susceptible to the argument, how can this be? So, of course, in a few weeks, we're going to go to Bethlehem. And we're going to go there to a manger to see a child plopped in an animal trough with a bunch of straw. And we're going to look at that child and say, oh, God's son has been born among us. That is no more likely than this is my body of the bread. That child is God's son. That bread is the body of Christ. 
So uh, in, in Western culture, now I'm going to take you back to philosophy 101, Aristotle had the principle that the finite, the earthly, is not capable of the infinite, the divine. That was Aristotle. Aristotle's philosophy has really, really long legs, both for good and for ill. You know, Aristotle's a good guy. Um, but his principle, the finite not capable of the infinite, ends up ruling a large subsection of the Reformation. So Calvinistic Christianity and related Calvinistic churches tend to accept and teach the principle that the finite, bread, wine, body, all these things, are not capable of the infinite. So for most American Christians, spirituality is all about getting rid of the body, getting rid of visible means, getting rid of preaching, getting rid of preachers, getting rid of vestments, getting rid of pomp and circumstance, so that everything becomes airy, fairy spirituality. That ain't the Christianity of the Bible, I'm here to say. It's a total abdication uh, of the biblical dogma that God uses the flesh of Mary to deliver his own eternal son, flesh of our flesh, bone of our bone, into our presence in time, in history. And that's why, for example, at the beginning of John's first epistle, John makes a big fuss about we touched him, we saw him, we handled him, we perceived him. Who is he? He's God's son. Right? And, of course, reason says what? That's impossible. But you see, to quote our little hymn, God can accomplish vastly more than seemeth plain to thee. Right? Either God's God or your God. It's just that simple. Right? It's a first commandment problem. And so a lot of American Christianity has jettisoned the means by which God delivers himself and his blessings to his people in time. Hodekai nun. Uh, I, I, I don't know when it was, probably three, four years ago, I, I just jammed into my brain this little Greek phrase. It means here and now. Um, so he is present with us. And he uses these, you know, I mean, so when the sacrament is in your mouth, there's no doubt. It's not about some airy-fairy, I'm going up here somewhere. It's all about, I'm in here. And I'm humble enough and love you enough that I will give myself to you in this very tangible way. Can you mess it up? Sure. But you see, God loves you enough to hand himself over to you in very dangerous situations where he can be terribly abused. They came at him with hammers and nails, you know. Right? He's used to that. Um, so, um, so it's important to kind of get straight whether or not the stuff of this world is susceptible to God's use. And when you put it that way, the answer is pretty simple. Of course it is. Didn't he create it? Yes. So, but again, uh, the great debate, and of course many Lutherans have lost track of this, and they really are children of the other part of the Reformation. Because they want everything all spirit and nothing flesh, and this is really bad. It's interesting because Jesus warns us that our Heavenly Father can send both body and soul to Gehenna if salvation isn't also bodily I'm in trouble <laughs> right because I'm a whole person body and soul and so Christ takes on my body and soul at the incarnation that he might save me and then uses those kinds of tangible means 
to confirm me in that faith and hope. Yeah? Let me pause there. Long speech. Sorry. Sorry about Aristotle and so on. Plato's no better, so... So remember now, we're only talking about churchly definitions. So if we come to you and we decide to come to church, mm -hmm. we don't pray to our parents, we just pray to the church. Yeah. And then we find out that we're living together in love and together. Right. I'm going to ask you to, to go through a, a public ceremony. And public in the sense that it's conducted in such a way that you can get a legal marriage certificate. I mean... Uh, so the church never wants to overthrow the institutions of government. And, and government says to be legally married, you know, you have to go through this process and get these signatures and wait three days and blah, blah. Um, there was a great debate at the time of Obergefell. Should we decline to do marriage solemnizations, period? so that we do not appear to be confirming our government in a perverted view of holy marriage. And, you know, we may get there someday, but I don't think we're there yet. We still owe honor and respect to the left-hand kingdom. I'm in charge of the right-hand kingdom, and so are you. I, I don't mean to say me in exclusion of you. but. But the government's in charge of the left-hand kingdom. And, you know, they have to do what they have to do, and I have to live within it unless they're going to force me. Like, for example, if... This is Texas, so it like, ain't going to happen. But, I mean, say the state came along and said, because of Obergefell, you have to marry any and all comers. And, of course, then somebody would say... I know those narrow-minded Lutherans are not going to want to marry two men or two women or a man and a dog or whatever it is these days. Um, uh, so we're going to go give it the test case, right? So they're going to draft somebody to come and demand to be married and so on. And I'm going to say, I can't do it. Sorry. I love you. I want to preach repentance to you. I don't want to see you damned forever, you know. But that, of course, these days is not good enough, and I'll end up in court. And I'll end up in jail. That's just the way it is. If that's the way, you know, the government is going to... And I'll just have to say, well, I guess I'll be preaching the gospel in jail. That's it. Right? I don't get to fight back. Right? I'm like Dr. King in the Birmingham jail. Now, I don't think Dr. King stayed in the Birmingham jail. I mean, you know, philosophically... Right? That was unfortunate. But, I mean, he had the right idea early in the civil rights movement. But I would just have to go. It's my duty. But I couldn't bow down to government's perversion of holy marriage. And at various times, Christians have just have to do, had to do this. You know, uh, Whether we're talking about the Lutherans of Nazi Germany, um, many of whom ended up in concentration camps or who had Gestapo following them constantly, like Sasse, for example. Um, Bonhoeffer, of course, is, is summarily executed uh, two or three days before his prison camp is, is uh, freed by, I think, Americans. Um, Martin Niemöller, constantly followed by the Gestapo, and so on. So, anyway, I'll get off on that. Um, but did I answer your question? Oh, sorry. Oh, the marriage thing. Okay. I was thinking back more to the question of visible means and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um,
And I'm just going to give you my opinion. You're welcome to think what you like. This is what Lutherans would call a theologumenon. That is, a, a theological opinion. It's based on what I believe. It's based on what the Bible says. It's based on our Lutheran confession. Conscientious objection has no basis in Lutheran theology. When your government says go and they hand you a rifle, you go. That, and, you know, we, we want to shake our finger at the Wehrmacht, right? The German war machine of World War II. But not every soldier was a Nazi. And their government came to them and said, here's the gun, we're going that way. And they went. Um, so, um, I, I, I just, now, I mean, again, I could conscientious, well, let me, let me put it a different way. You could conscientiously object, but then you end up in the stockade. And I'm not going to come to your rescue and say it's okay for you to do that. It's just not going to happen. Uh, there's no basis for it in our Lutheran theology. It, does it make life messy? Uh, yeah. But I hate to say this, sometimes life is, well, just messy. Yeah. We don't have all the answers, but I would just say you don't really have grounds for conscientious objection. Now, again, you might refuse to go, but then you have to take the punishment. You know, you have to be like Muhammad Ali, who would agree to beat people up but didn't want to kill anybody. Each to their own. All right. Um, it's interesting, uh, Huldreich Zwingli, Ulrich Zwingli, uh, who was a Swiss reformer and represents sort of the left-hand side of the Reformation, said, God does not need a cart. And of course, he was rejecting the Lutheran doctrine of sacraments. The church's doctrine of sacraments, let's just be honest. Um, and so we would say God does need a cart, not in the sense that he's required to use one, but that he has condescended to use that which is susceptible to our digestion to give us himself. Okay? Again, the incarnation being the excuse me, the primary example. We've already seen a place, of course, and there's all kinds of places in the Bible where God uses specific means for his purposes. So how, does, how do we get faith? Hearing. Where does the hearing come from? The Word of God. The Word of God's pretty tangible. Hearing, pretty tangible, right? So it's not airy-fairy, you know, the Spirit came on me like, uh, what was the old um, show in the 60s? Um, uh, Twilight Zone. Do, 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 do. There's a lot, that's why a lot of people think God shows up, you know, like a lightning bolt in your dreams or whatever. It's a horrible idea to think God comes to you in your dreams. <sighs> yeah, he did. He did say that, right? And whether he did or not is a. I mean, even Wesley was doubtful about it, which is interesting. Um, but again, that's God's arrival separated from visible means. You don't, is it God or the devil? I mean, really, yeah. And that's, for Lutherans, again, that's why we're so tied down. The Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God. Does it say, does it say, what has Christ said? What does the Bible say? What do the prophets say? We're stuck with that. There's no... It's not like um, the Wizard of Oz, right? There's no little man behind the curtain. There's only the stuff that God himself delivers to us. This is who God is. There's no sneaking behind it and figuring it out. Yeah? Okay. Oh, dear. I do have to update those pictures, don't I? Um, why do we need... Yeah, right, exactly. Not, it's not even a year and a half, my dear. It's less than that. Uh, not that anybody's counting. Um, <laughs> we are creatures of flesh and blood, so flesh and blood means are really important to us. Hebrews 2.14. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, that's us, he himself, Christ, likewise partook of the same thing. 
And that's why we're so excited about Christmas. Christmas is the season of the Incarnation. It's not the season of Santa Claus, right? It's the season of the Incarnation. And it tells us who we are. We are so important to God that he took our own flesh and became one of us. It doesn't get any better than that. And that's again, as Pastor Murphy said in his sermon today, we're, we're children of God. We're not worthy even to unlatch his sandals, but that he doesn't, that's not what he's interested in. What he's interested in is his getting down on his knees and unlatching our sandals. Right? So he takes our flesh and makes use of it. Um, objective means of grace give certainty of delivery. So if you're tied down to a specific word, a specific act, a specific time and place, you know, you know what you got on your hands. But if you're left with the spirit arriving sort of like out there somewhere, then you're never certain. And the, the Bible, if anything, teaches certainty, right? It doesn't teach uncertainty. It teaches certainty of salvation, certainty of the gifts of God, certainty of God's arrival. I mean, all these things, right? Now, you know, it, they're only susceptible to faith, but faith then grabs hold of something certain and objective. In today's lesson, what is the objective thing? It's your baptism. How do I know I'm a child of God? Because I am baptized into Christ. That's how I know. And that's always true. It's always certain. It doesn't, God doesn't go back on his promises. You're worthless. I get that. But that's not the point. The point is God always fulfills his promises. And his promises are delivered in these visible means in connection with his word. Ah, now I have everything. Don't get any better than that. Okay? So, specifically then baptism. Just to ref uh, refresh our memories, it is instituted by Christ. Go there and make this... Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So we have a specific command of Christ to both teach and to, to baptize. Okay? And notice who gets baptized? All nations, right? We'll, we'll, we'll make a point about that when we get there. Um, what does it mean to baptize? The Greek word baptizo simply means to wash. So when mother does the dishes, she actually baptizes them in Greek. So the point is, it's any application of water for the purpose of washing. Brian? When you say that the people who argue that baptizo is the equivalent of clean water, so... Hang on. I will give you the answer to that one. So we get it, what Jesus actually says, Mark 7, 4. I'm sorry, this is not Jesus, it's St. Mark. The Jews do not eat unless they wash. So they had these ritual washings, they were called baptisms. Okay? And there are, are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups, pots, copper vessels, and dining couches. So unless you have really a big pool in the backyard... In first century Palestine, you don't, unless your name's Herod, that's it. You're not dunking or immersing a dining couch. This is a triclinium. It would be about the width of that table and about another third long. It might be a little bit lower. Um, they did not eat sitting. They ate reclining, often, not always. Um, so this is what it's talking about, a dining couch. Um, you know, when, when mother says it's time to wash the table, she hands you the wash rag. You don't immerse the table. I mean, if you grabbed the table and said, well, I'm off to the bathroom to immerse the table, mom, she'd go, you've got problems, sonny. Let's talk about this, right? So not all washing has to be immersion. This is purely an imposition. That imposition, by the way, comes from the American experience of water not the Palestinian experience of water, right? 
What do you have? You have the Mississippi. You have the Ohio. You have the Colorado. You and on and on. Mississippi, Mississippi is 50 feet deep and a mile wide at New Orleans. Of course you dunk people in it. There's lots of water. Um, I was just at the Jordan River, what, uh, 18 months ago? A little bit more than that now. And I could have walked across. I, I don't even mean by walking on it, right? I mean, that's somebody else's deal. Um, I could have walked across. Of course, the problem was there were Jordanian troops with, uh, with, with live weapons on the other side. So I thought, hey, I better not do that, right? Um, and there was a relatively good amount of water at that place in the Jordan at that time. There would have been times where the Jordan was only ankle deep. The idea that Jesus was immersed doesn't have any basis in the reality of the thing itself. All right, there's more to this and we'll get there. So we have actual cases of mass baptisms, right? So you get one in Acts 2.41 on Pentecost Day. So those who received his word, Peter's preaching, were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So Peter baptized 3,000 people in one day in the city of Jerusalem. Now, where does Peter find these pools in which to immerse 3,000 people? They're basically two public sources of water in the city of Jerusalem in the first century. What are they for? Drinking. You dump 3,000 people, and remember, none of them have bathed, perhaps for months, right? I mean, the, our ideas of cleanliness do not exist in the first century. They're filthy. And now Peter is saying, hey, we got to dunk all these people in the public drinking water of the city of Jerusalem. What will happen next? Riots. They will rip Peter limb from... So he doesn't do it that way. He brings amphora or has amphora water brought and sprinkles and baptizes, right? So the idea of immersion, even on the first occasion of a mass baptism, is just ludicrous. Yeah, so we want to talk about the mode of Jesus' baptism. Everyone says, well, he was baptized in the Jordan and so on. Well, of course he was. Um, so Mark 1.10 says, And when he, that is Jesus, came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. Now, by up out of the water, what Greek means is out of the water course and onto the shore. It doesn't mean from below the water and out of the water, right? So you have to keep that straight. Um, and again, the Jordan at best, maybe thigh or waist deep. At worst, in many places, it's, it's ankle deep. At the wrong time of the year, it might be dead dry. Again, it's Palestine. They have, they have rains in the winter, and then months where it doesn't rain, right? So you have to be aware of that. Yeah, up out of means source, right? So up out of the source of the baptism, i.e. the river, right? All right, let me pause there. Did I answer your question? Okay. Um, who is to be baptized? What does the Bible actually say? All nations. Yep. Who's that leave out? Nobody. So infants are to be baptized because, like for example, um, my daughter and son-in-law adopted a child, what, seven weeks ago today, born seven weeks ago today. And so they got her home on the next Wednesday and if the census taker had arrived on Thursday and said, how many people of this nation are in this household, they would have said three, right? So no one would say that an infant isn't part of the nation or a nation, right? So again, there's no basis for restricting the age of baptism. Yeah, because they belong to a people of a nation. Matthew 28, 19. 
uh, go there for, for and make disciples of all nations. How? By baptizing them and so on. Um, we also recognize, and this is not shared by all Christians, of course, but, but the Bible certainly teaches that all people, infants and everybody, are born sinful and are in need of rebirth. Uh, there's lots of passages to this effect, um, probably one that's extremely helpful, and one which perhaps you know, Psalm 51, verse 5. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Now, some American Christians, to be as generic as I possibly can, um, have said that David is saying bad things about his mother that she was in sin when she conceived me. How likely do you think that is? <laughs> uh, not very, right? The point of this is, I was in iniquity from my conception. Right? And you have to remember the context of Psalm 51. It's a psalm of confession. David knows better than to confess his mother's sin. Right. I mean, that's not the point of the psalm. The psalm is David confessing his own sin and depravity, right? So, um, Jesus, of course, John 3.3, 3, Truly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The, the, I don't know how you get any more necessary than that. You're a sinner. Um, you, you can't get into the kingdom of God unless you're born again. By the way, it's interesting, the word for again can also mean from above in Greek. So born again, born from above, and I think the ambiguity is quite intentional. Yeah, so you do have uh, in Acts cases where whole households were baptized. Um, And we, like, in one case, we know that the household probably consisted of as many as 100 people. Uh, that would have included slaves, relatives, the children of the relatives, the children of the slaves, and so on. And it indicates to us that everyone in the household was baptized. Now, is that ironclad for baptizing a two-day-old? No. Yeah, sure. Sure, sure. It, it, you would say it is supportive, correct. Yeah. But you can't find, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's just keep going, sorry. So sometimes people argue that little children can't be believers. You ever ask one? I mean, ask my granddaughter babysat for her on Friday. Are you a believer? She just went, you know, well, I don't know if that's yes or no, you know. So, let's ask Jesus. Maybe he knows. Ah, but he does. What does he say? Truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children. So notice, first of all, the comparison. If you want to be saved, you become like a child. Right? We don't ask children to become like adults. We ask adults to become like children. So children are the best case scenario, not the most difficult case scenario. You adults are the difficult case, right? Okay. Um, unless you become like a child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child, he has one right there in his lap, is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me, right? So it's not merely... Um, you know, kindred feeling, but it is the life of the church to receive the humblest and in that way receive a humble Christ. But whoever causes one of these micron um, engineers, a micron is how big? It's all the same to me. Uh, pretty tiny. Um, so how little are we talking? the littlest infant, who believe in me to sin. Jesus says, 
that the littlest child is a believer. Who are you to say they can't be? Again, you're welcome to your opinion, but given a choice between your view and the view of Jesus, I'm going to take the view of Jesus every time. Okay? And of course, if you, if you cause one of these ones to stumble, it would be better for you to have a great millstone hung around your neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. That's bad news, I think. Yeah? All right. So we're always going to invite the little ones. They are believers. Uh, God uses visible, tangible means to bring them into his kingdom. I do find it, and it's purely opinion. It's pure opinion. What do infants come out of when they're born? A bag of water. The amniotic fluid. What, what does God use to bring them into his kingdom? Water. Now, again, this is pure opinion, right? But I always am amazed as I'm baptizing even the smallest infant. They hear the water at a baptism. And often, not always, but often, their eyes roll up because they want to see what the sound is behind them. They know it's water, right? And, and so they're intrigued by this. And I think God very purposely uses that most common, I mean, what, how much of the Earth's surface is water? I don't know, a lot. Um, what is it, probably 80% 80, 80 of the po uh, population, 80% of the surface of the Earth is covered with water, something like that. Sometimes more here in Houston. Um, but you know how it goes. Um, but, but we use this most common thing. And again, that's always God's way, to take what's obvious and common and, and make it a delivery method for his gracious care of his people. All right, let me pause there. So infants can believe, so they're not out of the game for that reason. I would say, this is my opinion, those who refuse to baptize infants do not understand the Bible's teaching on sin and grace, especially not on grace. Um, who is less capable, an infant or an adult? An infant, of course. They have to be brought. They have to be fed. They have to be diapered. They, they do nothing, right? They cry, sleep, eat. But you've got to deliver everything to them. But you see, that is exactly what faith is to have everything delivered to you by God. So if, if you start to say you have to have this age, you have to be capable of that, you've just said that it is not by grace, but by works. It's not God's act, but your ability. And once you've gotten there, you have overthrown the Christian gospel, hook, line, and sinker. That's where you are. Dean? Yes. No, it, it was never practiced, as far as we know, from the literature of the ancient church, uh, at, ever until the 16th century when the far left Reformation began to say, you know, you have to do something to prove your confidence in God so that God thinks you're wonderful. Well, the fact is, that's simply a trip back to the Pope's hip pocket. Because as soon as you start to say, something I do, something I think, something I feel, whatever it is, is making you right with God, you're just simply back into the whole salvation by works. It, it, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's more or less works, it still works. So, um, 
I, I love baptizing infants, especially. Of course, I love baptizing anybody who wants to be baptized, of course. If you're not, by the way, anybody in this class that's not baptized, let me know. We'll take care of that. But, um, but especially infants, because, of course, they're the best case scenario, not the worst case scenario. They don't bring themselves. Well, nobody brings themselves to God anyway. Right? God comes to us. That's the point of the incarnation. That's the point of the means of grace, right? So, yeah. Myron? Question, Lord. I was thinking, kind of backtrack a little bit, um, about the belief of infants. And I'm speaking of um, when Mary gives her a visitor. Yes. Uh, she went to this and um, the child in the first scene is uh, said that this could be a sign of it. Upon hearing, there is that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you have a obvious a case where a six month old uh, um, child in utero uh, is described as leaping in joy at meeting the mother of his Lord. Um, <laughs> a dear colleague of mine uh, read the Greek New Testament on a nightly basis to his wife's growing uh, belly when she was pregnant with their second child. And um, the son, as it turned out, I, I actually baptized him. His name's Paul, and he's my godson. And he's got a photographic memory, and he teaches Hebrew at Concordia University, Irvine. So whether he didn't pay attention to his dad's reading Greek or what, I don't know, but he's a Hebrew expert instead. Um, but uh, children, do they recognize the voice of their own mother, right? We know this, right? That you get an infant, a day old, and they can tell the difference in the voice between their own mother and another female voice. Um, so, I mean, all of that, I, again, this is purely my, you, you can disagree to your heart's content. But I think, I mean, how many of you can remember stuff from before you were, say, four? Can you? Okay. <laughs> I'm with you, right? But um, so I mean, I I think I can remember things from younger, but I I always have to stop myself and say, but I have a photograph of that, right? And that helps. Well, I think children think in pictures. And only as they develop high facility in language do they switch. To thinking in words. Well, what happens once you've you've categorized everything by words, is you lose access to the information by pictures. That it's back there, it's in the hard drive someplace, but you don't have the means to access it generally, right? Only only in some exceptional circumstances, um, and so that's why you can't remember having believed as a two-year-old, and yet you were, uh, I can't remember not believing. Right? I can think of myself in church. I would have been four, probably. I don't think I was in school yet. But I believed what I was being told. Right? And I, I, I've never been outside of that experience, ever. I'm, don't misunderstand. I have doubts. That's not the same thing. You're still a believer in the midst of your doubts. But so anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, and, and the problem, too, is we've turned faith into rationality. You know, when the child is fully rational, then they can... Wait a minute. Is that what faith is? Then, then what do we do with Ricky Kitchell? 
who's got sort of the, the capacity of a two-year-old, and yet I'd take Ricky Kitchell's faith any day, right? Um, he's very confident of what God has done for him. He can put it in the very simplest terms, and that's it. But, uh, you know, so I... Anyway, so let's just keep going. Um, the question a little bit asked, there's no time the church can be shown not to have baptized infants. There is a protest in the third century against baptizing infants in one church father, but what that indicates is that, of course, infants were being baptized, and this guy had been bitten by the finite is not capable of the infinite doctrine and began to doubt whether or not infants should be baptized. Um, there is no such thing as a Lutheran baptism. You're either baptized or you ain't. Um, so there's no such thing as a Baptist baptism. In some places, especially like Oklahoma and Kansas and so on, as you move from Baptist church to Baptist church, they'll actually rebaptize you. It's a, it's a rite of entry into specific congregations. Um, uh, they will rebaptize, of course. Uh, when I was at Baptist Seminary in New Orleans, one of the professor's wives had, had reached the number 20. And, of course, it was all about she had backslid. Well, what is that? I mean, if I were rebaptized every time I sinned, and, and then the question is, what is baptism? Is it my proving to God how wonderful I am, or is it God giving me the benefits of his Son as a gracious gift? Will he go back on that promise because I'm a sinner? No, he will not. He does not. He fulfills his promises. He remains faithful even when you are not. That's what it means to be God. Myron, sorry. Yeah. Right. right. I think you're right about that. They're seeking what confession and absolution does. Right. Yeah, maybe. You don't want to presume every person who's sort of on the wrong track is being perfunctory, right? They're, they may be sincere, but of course you can be sincerely wrong, right? So. Um, just one last point. It comes back a little bit to, to, to Brian's uh, point. The Jewish rite of proselyte baptism also included infants. So what most people are not aware of is that in the first century, um, Jewish missionaries, both within Palestine and in the larger Gentile world, brought people into the Jewish faith in a couple of ways. One of them was by proselyte baptism. So they received a ritual washing that said, you know, Gentile you were, Jewish you are. Okay? We know from history that everybody in a household where the father became a Jew was, was proselyte baptized into Judaism. Infants, adults, men, women, everybody. So when Jesus says, go baptize, he's talking to 12 Jews who know the ritual baptism of Judaism. They also know that when you baptize, you baptize everybody in the family. Nobody gets left out. Now this is obviously an, an argument from silence or a negative argument. Jesus would have had to have said, and oh, by the way, we're not doing this like Jewish ritual proselyte baptism. We're not baptizing everybody like those Jews. I mean, he had a good reason to say that, right? Because that's the opposition. But he doesn't say that, right? So it is, it is certainly an argument from silence. But there was Jewish uh, proselyte baptism where everyone was baptized. There was no age limit. Oh, sure. No. Mm -mm. We know it from Talmud um, and other Jewish documents. 
that tell us about Jewish practice uh, uh, and Jew the application of Jewish law. It, it's a fascinating subject and one which I'm glad someone else, someone else has taken up. I've, I've never been much of a Talmud reader, I have to admit. But we've got scholars that do that stuff. Right, exactly, exactly. All right, so let's let's uh, break off there. So next week is the 17th. What we'll do next week is we'll start, not here, but with the sacrament of the altar, so that those of you who are not yet uh, brought in can go through that instruction and then you may receive the sacrament thereafter, again, with the understanding that your plan is to join you know, at that point. Okay, um, And then we'll come back and finish baptism and absolution probably after Christmas. Yeah? Any further questions before we close with prayer? All right, let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you that you have saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Help us to be confident of what you have called our life and salvation. Uh, enable us to see that you are in that water, uh, connected with your word, that we're drowned there into your death and raised again to the new life of your resurrection. Uh, bless our study that we might also share this hope and faith with others who know baptism only as a legalistic symbol and not as a gracious gift from a good God. All this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Okay.